Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It'll just be a few moments and we will be getting started very soon. All right, Kimberly's here. Well, there we go. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Awesome. So good to see you again. Good to see you too. Yes. Oh, are we live? Are we streaming? We are just getting started. Is that okay with you? We're official. We're in the internet. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, so many great features. Yeah, we have a, an associated Facebook group too. So okay. um, that's something just on the side through some of the other boot camps I've done. And I thought, what a great way to just share this content. Yes, yes, that is fantastic. So we have some, I want to give people a few moments. I did send everyone a, an updated account uh, URL. So they're logging in. So give everyone a, maybe two more minutes. Okay. Um, but we're really excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. I'm so ah, excited. Yes. And remind me again where you're, you're out I'm east. In California. I'm in Cal oh, California. I drove between Ohio. Well, before I was really going in between Ohio and uh, and LA, but um, I'm really out in the LA area. So I lived originally in Carson, which is just south of LA, but then I moved a little bit further east. So I'm in Riverside County because um, I, I had, before I was teaching at UC Irvine, so I have a whole story to tell you, but yes, yes. I, am, I am east of LA now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it pretty warm out there? Right um, the, yes. Thank God for solar panels because I have been running <laughs> my air condition. It's actually decent downstairs, but my, my, uh, the bedroom that I converted to an office upstairs by like 12 o'clock, clearly if it's a 90 day, like mm. the air condition is, is coming on. So, but I have an awesome view of the mountains from right here. So I'm not going to complain. Yeah. Trade-offs. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we're starting to have finally some cool mornings in Colorado and uh, it makes a difference to have it not be 82 degrees at 5 a.m. Yeah, you know, and I haven't been to Denver in a while and I wouldn't, I would say like in October, like on a Saturday it was like 95 degrees and I got sunburn on my shoulder and then the next day we got like seven inches of snow and I was like, what in the heck? It's, it's, it's a little uh, manic depressive weather. It is. It is. I like it though. I like the extremes sometimes. At least all four seasons is the way to, to live life, I think, if possible. Yeah. The view of the mountains though, the thing I was, I lived east and I had to drive west every day. And I just said, God, please don't ever let me get bored with this view. Mm. And every day driving down Arapahoe. Mm. That's that it. view is so majestic. So I should, I should come and see you. You so. should come visit. Yes. Yeah. I was born and raised in Colorado and like the whole drive down, I still, I mean, 40 years later, I mean, I've lived a few other places, but mm -hmm. the mountains can never get old in my opinion. No, no. Same with the ocean. Right. For sure. Same nature. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we've got some people logging in and uh, we're hitting around the, the time to get started. So wanted to take a moment now and just say thank you so much to everyone uh, who is joining us. I'm Allison Daly. I am the founder and CEO of Recruiting Innovation, your host for uh, our webinar today. Um, also your host for the Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant. Um, this talent grant is something that we at Recruiting Innovation just launched. Um, two weeks ago formally, and then we launched the actual program about six weeks ago. So the first cohort is now live in the world, which we're so excited about. We have 37 people in this cohort. Uh, these are the grant recipients were selected from applications to um, be part of this grant program that is designed to provide our tech recruiter certification um, from Recruiting Innovation, along with uh, additional training and support and mentorship to uh, people from underrepresented talent groups. So uh, black, indigenous, people of color, um, LGBTQIA plus uh, members of the talent community, disabled folks, um, people that just in general, we want to see more of, and we want to provide our resources to help them grow and flourish. And what I consider one of the most approachable industries out there, which is recruiting. Um, one of the key tenants at Recruiting Innovation through our training is to help drive diversity in tech, the tech industry through training and developing recruiters. And what better way to drive uh, diversity than to build diverse recruiting teams. And so that's what our goal is with Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant. 
And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our very first speaker for our leadership series, Kimberly Jones. Um, she has a bunch of acronyms after her name. So <laughs> PHR, she's a certified, um, I'll let her give into her, her intro. I know she, she does that better than, than I would. But Kimberly, is, when she saw our announcement that we launched the grant, she right away wrote me and said, I am interested in supporting. How do I be involved? And I, it, it couldn't mean more from someone like you, Kimberly. So thank you so much. Um, so what we're doing with our leadership series, this is twice a month for the three months that we have our cohort, our grant cohort. And this is when we get to hear from exceptional leadership in the talent acquisition space. Kimberly is going to tell us more about her career, but just as a little bit of a background, she has worked and led talent acquisition with some of the largest, most complex organizations out there from Raytheon, GE, Honda. Um, she's even done a stint at one of the poles of our globe, which is interesting. And she is now CEO at Kelton Legend, which is a multi-dimensional talent and talent consultancy. And she is also a professor. So she has a lot going on. Um, she also does speaking. I recently did her end-to-end -end training um, where she talks about how do we help build a diverse organization, not just through our team, but thinking through our vendors and like the whole end-to-end -end as an organization, how do we bring a, a diversity focused intention as across our organization. So without further ado, it is my pleasure, uh, Kimberly Jones, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, I am so excited, I'm so excited. So um, I'm gonna use my time wisely. I have a little clock off to the side because I don't wanna eat up my time. Um, and then I wanna make sure I share information, but I wanna make sure we give ourselves um, enough time for some good Q and A. And so um, I'll be looking at the, the chat window. We may take a question in between, but definitely I wanna make sure we have have a good uh, robust session. Um, one thing I do want to mention is um, I, I just believe the fate and universe. I mentioned yesterday that uh, you and I met literally over the snack table uh, at ERE. And so um, one of the things I'm hopeful that I'll be able to share with uh, the group today is um, the universe finds a way <laughs> to get you everything that you're supposed to have. And so yes, I so. believe it was fate that uh, Allison and I uh, met and then I'm able to share with you guys today. So I'm looking forward. I know that the the connections that I'm making with you guys today all um, all have a purpose as well. So um, Allison, I actually have a, um, a PowerPoint slide I want to share with the group. Great. So gonna, um, I think you should Let me double check, give you all access. Um, how about I just make you host just to be sure and then you should be able to do whatever you need. Yeah, okay, so let me see if I can. And while, we're, while she's setting that up, everyone, please feel free to post your questions into the chat box. Like Kimberly said, she'll keep an eye on that. Um, but we definitely, this is an open session. We want this to be your session too. So all questions welcome. Okay, let's see if I can do a screen share. Okay, and can you guys see my screen? Yep, we see the full presenter scenario. So also like next slide, if that's okay. Um, next, you know what, that's okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, um, nothing to hide. So, all right. So, um, so under this concept of leadership, I'm gonna tell you guys a really crazy story about my, my life and career. Um, sometimes it's about life, sometimes about career, but I will tell you it's been this awesome, um, awesome blend of both. And so where I want to start, if it goes, um, is a question. And um, actually, I'm going to start with two questions. So this first question is, um, if this road is your career, um, how do you make it through your journey? So if you had a flat, um, straight road through the desert, <laughs> um, you know, what type of preparation would you uh, need to make to get yourself ready for this type of journey. Likewise, uh, if this roller coaster were your career, um, how would you make it through this ride? And so for those of us who are daredevils at heart, look at this and say, bring it on. Others who say, I'll hold your bag while you get on the ride. I'll be here when you get back. Um, you know, this, this might create a different level of anxiety. The reason why I start 
wanted to start this discussion with these two questions is we all have plans. Some of us plan for a roller coaster, some of us plan for a straight ride. Regardless to what you plan for, you have to be prepared for whatever it, for whatever version of this because there will be some flat road portions of your life, but there's also some roller coaster um, moments of your life. I think COVID and uh, the current social injustice um, definitely have given us all some version of roller coaster and how you're able to navigate your way through that is, um, you know, based on a lot of things. And I'm, I want to share some things with you guys today. So I'm going to tell you this story. This is a true story. It's not, you're not, not based on a true story, not adopted from a true story. This is not a lifetime uh, movie uh, channel version. So this is my whole entire true story. So um, as Allison mentioned, I've, I've been very blessed, very fortunate to have worked for uh, a number of organizations. Um, let me start with, um, I'll start at the bottom. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I am the youngest of 11. I have nine sisters and one brother. And so uh, a portion of what I'll share with you guys today also is about diversity. I learned diversity being a member of my family. I have every version of sister that you can think of. Um, sisters who sing, who cook, um, see, um, sang in the choirs, you know, sang by themselves. A sister who was like one of the dopest basketball players, softball, a little bit, I have one sister who could have been a race car driver. Um, and so one of the things I share with people about why it was easy for me to understand this concept of diversity, my parents never required us to be like each other, but we had to be a Jones. So we understood the Jones family values. And as long as what you were doing in your individual gifts and talents you know, uh, aligned with those Jones family values, you could you could be whatever you wanted to be. And so it has helped shape me for who I am just individually, but also as an HR professional. Um, I'm also a graduate of Wilberforce University. Wilberforce is one of the 100 or so um, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, Wilberforce is named after an abolitionist, William Wilberforce. And Wilberforce was also part of the Underground Railroad. So when slaves were able to escape from the South, come from Kentucky across the Ohio River, up through Ohio, um, a portion of the Underground Railroads, uh, safe places are actually part of campus. And so I uh, take a lot of pride in having been educated at a university that was named after um, an abolitionist, someone who understood that people are not property, should not have been kept as property, and worked very tire tirelessly to make sure um, that um, everybody had an opportunity to, to be free. Um, uh, one other piece about who I am, I am a dog mom. I have um, two boxers, um, Harper Chanel Jones and Skyler Love Jones. My dogs do have first, middle, and last names. Um, and so they are very uh, much a part of what I do. They are also my brand ambassadors. And so every year I produce a calendar for my company and Harper and Skyler have been my brand ambassadors. And dare I not post a picture or go too long without posting a picture, somebody is usually in my inbox asking me like, where are Harper and Skyler? So they are very much part of my identity. Um, I, like I said, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I started my career originally at Nationwide. Nationwide was like the second largest employer in Columbus. And it was, you know, normal for a lot of, you know, people in my generation to aspire to work there. And so um, for me, my father worked for a construction company. I, as a child, wanted to be an architect because I was fascinated by what architects did. And once I got to high school, I realized I liked math. I was not good enough at it to pursue a math-based career. And so I had to figure out how to pivot and like, what do I do? Well, what I recognize is this fascination I have with buildings. I'm like, let me just go work in a pretty building. And so Nationwide was the tallest, prettiest building, uh, actually not the tallest, second tallest, um, prettiest building in Columbus. And so I'm like, well, let me go work at Nationwide. And the HR office was the first office when you came in the lobby. I'm like, let me go work in HR. And then what I found out about, about HR was it was the organization within a company that had to learn everything about 
the organization, less consultants. I'm like, yes, sign me up for that. And it is the best decision I've ever made. And so worked for Nationwide in a number of roles, benefits a little bit, but mostly in recruiting. I have recruited for everything. Um, I recruited for actuaries on both the uh, property casualty, life and health. Um, I managed all of the immigration. So for F1, H1, J1, visas, green card, um, I managed all of the diversity internship programs. So inroads, time joiner, United Negro College Fund. Um, the high school program that Nationwide had as well. So I worked really closely with the Chamber of Commerce and then also with um, Columbus, uh, Columbus Public Schools. Traveled a lot. Like there was at least one month, one year, I packed two suitcases at the beginning of July because I came home for like one day, picked up a new suitcase and was gone for the entire, entire month of July. And so I learned a lot of things just about life in general from traveling um, you know, as part of the work that I did. So... After being there for 13 years, I recognize like you can really stay here until you're 65, but do I want to? And um, I just decided as a recruiter, I could um, kind of secret shop other companies while I was at career fairs. And so I decided to do that and just said, don't wait for something perfect, you know, take a chance. And, you know, if you get an offer from a, a reputable organization, take a chance. So after 14 years, then I left and went to work for Honda. Um, so Northwest of Columbus, Honda plant. And so originally joined that team, um, helping put together diversity plans um, for diversity recruiting, NSBE, SWE, SHIP, um, ACES. And it didn't take long for me to recognize that there was not a, a cultural alignment there for me in that organization. And not because it was a Japanese manufacturing organization, it was really the people and the way in which they um, interacted with people and, and established expectations of people was not the right environment for me. Um, at one point, what, I, what um, happened, I was given a pager that um, we all had when we were away from the department out at one of the plants um they, they they needed a way to to stay in touch with us my pager wasn't working and so there would be times i'd get back to the uh, office and they you know we tried to get in touch with you and what i found out was the reason why my pager was not working uh, it had been dropped in a toilet and they actually gave me they knew it had been dropped in the toilet and they gave it to me and at that point, I recognize this is not a culture that I want to be a part of. If anybody thought it was okay to give a new employee, an old employee, whomever, a pager that had been dropped in the toilet. So fortunately for me, in the short time that I was there, being out, um, being out recruiting, I uh, met some people from Raytheon and had very positive experience um, experiences. And so um, just by, by chance, there's a position posted for Raytheon in Indianapolis. I apply, I interview, um, I get hired, and literally I leave, I drive on a Monday morning from Columbus to Indianapolis. I attend orientation. They didn't even have enough time to set up my relocation. I lived in a hotel for the first month, uh, first week that I was there until they could get my relocation set up. And so Working for Raytheon, I can honestly say was one of the best uh, parts of my career um, because of all the things that I, I learned and uh, what I was ex uh, exposed to. So um, moved um, into different leadership roles, projects. I was able to get Six Sigma, Six Sigma certified while I worked for uh, Raytheon um, as well. I was there for about seven years and um, just by chance happened to, you know, check a job board that wasn't necessarily looking. And then this position was open to GE Aviation. And so they had never recruited externally. They had always hired from their college program. And so within the engines division, um, there was strategic talent acquisition manager position. And I literally, I didn't know anybody at GE. Everybody kept saying, you know, everybody knows somebody. I didn't, I just applied and interviewed and joined the team. So I managed the recruiting team for the engines division, which is 19 different departments within um, aviation and was able to triple the number of engineering hires in the first year. And so it was an awesome feat. And what was interesting about it, 
corporate noticed and came in a couple months after that and said, you know, we want to understand better what you put in place. And I explained it. And then they went away and then they came back and they said, we love what you did. We want you to replicate, help us replicate that across the other divisions. And then after you do that, then we'll just eliminate your job. No. So uh, <laughs> I knew at that point I was not about to give away all of the things that were in my mind. And so I go back on, you know, back to the internet and I'm like, let me find a new job. And so I see the position for Northrop Grumman in Redondo Beach, California. I apply, I phone interview, they fly me out. I arrived like on a Sunday, I interviewed for exactly one hour on a, on a Monday. The director had to, had to travel. She said, I honestly only have one hour to interview you. And I said, okay. So in that hour, we were, we, it, we, I got my interview done. Tuesday morning, I'm on my way back to the airport to leave and the recruiter called to extend me an offer. And so a month later, I relocate from Cincinnati, Ohio to, uh, to Redondo Beach, California. After only being there for six months, a search firm contacts me and says, we have this position at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Do you know about, do you know NASA? And I'm like, NASA, NASA? I'm like, yes, I know NASA. And they said, well, this team has been without a leader for the past three years. There's a lot of things that need to be done. You know, would you be interested? And so I go and I interview over like a couple of days. I interviewed with 17 people, um, four of which, one of which was their uh, deputy chief engineer who asked me every technical question that you should ask, but I think he was genuinely surprised that um, I answered all of the, I had to explain to him what I knew about all of the disciplines of engineering. And so, um, you know, completed the interview, got the offer. And so if anybody's familiar with the LA area, I lived in Carson at the time, which Carson is south of LA. The NASA lab is actually in La Cañada, not Pasadena. And so in LA traffic, it takes you on a good day, an hour and a half to drive 26 miles. However, it was my dream job and I toughed it out. Um, projects, operating model, performance standards, personalities, some of the smartest people in the world, congressional inquiries, background checks, everything that you can think of, um, you know, kind of all rolled into one was, was part of this experience. And then, I got to a point where I was tired of the drive. There were lots of things that were changing um, at the laboratory. And I had really just started evolving among my peer group in the TA community. And people had started asking me for help with system configuration, with strategy and process development. And I finally just decided, you know what, it's time for me to do this for me and do this for a much broader audience. And so um, I resigned on a Friday. I went home the next week for Thanksgiving and told my family I quit my job. <laughs> and I moved some money around. And by February 1st, I had my tax ID number. I had my website. I had all my statement of capabilities. And I launched my company, Kelton Legend, February 1st of 2017. So couple things about that. Um, so my name, Kimberly Denise Jones, I happened to share my name with um, a rapper and I wanna go to the chat window if I can. Is it this chat or Q and A that's open for us, Allison? Chat is, chat is open. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see where I can see it. I see Q and A, but I don't see the. Oh, I didn't hold on chat. There it is. Um, anybody who knows who I share a name with, if you can just, who? Okay, is that? Is it Denisha? Denisha said, "Little Kim, Denisha, I'm going to get your address from you and send you send you a prize." So, um, you are correct. Little Yay. Kim and I have the same exact name, Kimberly Denise Jones. <laughs> and so let me tell you why that's interesting. There would be times I would travel, I would get to a hotel and they thought it was her checking in. <laughs> and so I would sometimes get a room upgraded 
Um, one of the things about my career, because I've worked for aerospace companies, I've previously held a top secret um, clearance, uh, specifically in the area of Homeland Security. The very first month of my clearance process really was just about clearing out aliases because Kim Jones is a popular name. There's also, I think, a sportscaster, a news person, same name. Um, and so then trying to come up with a name for my company was really interesting because I didn't want to just be like Jones Consulting. And not that I don't love my last name. I just recognize it's a, um, a common name. And so I'm like Kelton. Well, Kelton is the name of the street that I grew up on. And so I just decided Kelton Legend. And so giving myself a brand and an identity in this new part of my life was, was really important. Um, not quite a year into my company, one of the things that I faced, which I know was, you know, because of being Black and being a woman, there were people who I would meet who would question my ability, my technical ability. How can you do HR configuration and you don't have a computer science background? You went to um, Wilberforce, they don't even have a computer science background, blah, you know, a program, blah, blah, blah. And so, um, Rather than allow people to continue to question my credibility, there was an opportunity to become an instructor at the University of California, Irvine. And so I interviewed for that position and was able to demonstrate my technical competence. And so I'm also an instructor at the University of California, Irvine, where I teach a course in technology applications and talent management. So any technology that a company would use to manage their workforce, I teach all of that technology, everything from HRIS systems to the use and integration of social media and artificial intelligence. And so let me go back now to those two questions that I asked you guys. If your life and your career is that straight road through the desert or the roller coaster, are you prepared? I can honestly tell you that as much as I knew I wanted to work in corporate America, I had no idea that my career and my life would take me on the journey that I've been on. There have been both good and bad days. I have learned from them all. I have survived them all. So me starting out this discussion with sharing with, sharing with you my journey is to tell you your journey may take the, the roller coaster version of it, I can also tell you, you have everything you need um, to be successful in navigating yourself um, through those journeys. Um, one thing I wanna point to in this slide, if you see in the bottom uh, left corner, that is me at the South Pole. And so when I worked for Raytheon, I managed the Polar Services program. I managed the entire team that hired all of the contractors that go to McMurdo, Palmer, South Pole, and then the two research vessels. And so while I was deployed in January of 2008, I had um, an opportunity to go to South Pole for three days. Now, what's crazy about this, I've shared this picture with people, and people were like, oh, you photoshopped yourself um, at the South Pole. And I'm like, I would photoshop myself with Michael B. Jordan. I'm not photoshopping myself at the South Pole. Like, I would not waste my good talents on that, that is really me at the South Pole. And um, the day that I, this is day two, the day that I arrived, it was like 35 below zero, like 50 below zero with the, with the wind chill. Um, and I will tell you it forever changed my life because I've been to the continent that most people don't get to go to. And so now I only have one continent left because I've been able to do some other travel. I just have South America to go to, but again, my career has afforded me access to experiences that have then opened other, um, other doors for me. So that's, that's my big story. So two things I wanna, I wanna be able to share with the group and let me, let me check the chat window, see if we have any, any questions before I go on. I don't see anything, so. So Allison, under this concept of leadership, I wanted to be able to share two things with the group. Um, leadership in general, and then leadership specifically in the area of talent acquisition. And so the movie Hidden Figures means a lot to me. Um, the, the Friday that I resigned from um, NASA, I had clearly second guessed myself. I was really good friends with a couple of black female engineers who had been technical consultants on the, on the movie. 
And so they had been invited to a special screening at Fox Studios um, for Hidden Figures. And so um, I knew the story in general, but not, not completely. And so as I sat in the theater, watching this movie, understanding NASA, understanding the littered history um, of this country, you know, decade by decade. Um, there's a scene in particular where Taraji uh, comes back from, you know, her mile across the, the campus to go to the restroom. And she has this emo emotional outburst. And it resonated with me because it was a very familiar emotion for things that I had experienced in my career as well. And um, at one point, I'm literally my hands, you know, my head, my face in my hands crying because I'm like, this confirmed for me. I'm not crazy. And the decision I had made to leave and, and do things on my own, you know, really just, like I said, it was, it was reaffirming. But I thought about the messages in this particular movie and what it means to be a leader. And these were the things that really stood out for me. First of all, being a technical expert, um, each of the ladies that were highlighted in this story, they knew what they knew, that nothing could shake them from knowing, knowing and being able to, to display it. It was whether or not they were really given opportunities um, and embraced. Um, also being a great communicator and a communicator to me isn't just about talking it's also about listening and so it's impossible to be a great leader if you are not also um, a great communicator. Um, the third piece around influencer you don't always necessarily have a title that gives you authority but the expertise and the information that you have gives you uh, a platform to influence. And so being able to influence title or no title um, is vitally important to being successful um, uh, in a role. Um, I tied these two things together, courageous and patient, because I, for me, I will say I had to have both simultaneously. You have to be courageous in that there will be things that challenge you and you have to know when to speak up. But that timing, is important. And so where you may sometimes want to leap into situations because you have that courage, you also have to be thoughtful enough about, do I, I need to be patient enough for the right moment to be courageous. And so um, those two together are really important. And then the last piece is self-aware. Um, feedback is awesome to be able to get feedback from other people who can see you objectively, offer constructive criticism. But on a regular basis, it is vitally necessary that you take the time to have those one-on-ones with yourself and really assess what experience did I have? Did I navigate that the right way? What did I hear? You know, what from the responses that I got back, um, how did people feel? Um, and not to be overly critical of yourself, but to be conscious of if I'm in this situation again, are these the words that I would use again? Is this the behavior? Is this the, the perspective that I would bring? Um, did I have the right allies um, and champions um, with me um, in that moment? Did I alienate anyone um, in those moments? So those, those elements of self-awareness are vital because you don't wanna get somewhere where you've set yourself up to fail versus really taking stock into who am I, what do I bring to the table, what's most important in this particular moment for whatever I'm sharing, presenting, um, owning, suggesting. You, you, have to be, uh, you have to be your own co-pilot in some situations so that you understand the perspective and the landscape that, um, that you're operating in. Um, the last thing that I'll share, and then we'll, we'll do some Q&A because I'm keeping an eye, uh, eye on the time, um, specifically in the area of talent acquisition. So as a leader, you also need to be a functional technical leader. And so I thought about the things that really make for a well-rounded leader, specifically in the area of talent acquisition. And so these are the things I will say I've all, um, areas I've had to learn and become expert in. And so you'll hear the term jack of all trades, master of none. In certain situations, you have to be dynamic in a number of disciplines on a regular basis. And this was something I learned, especially being at NASA, walking across the campus, 
I wasn't always prepared to be in a meeting. I didn't always have my laptop. Sometimes I was really walking across, walking across campus with my purse and my phone. And literally somebody would grab me and want me to talk about, you know, a rack, a position, a, a decision. And off the top of my head, I would have to be prepared to have those, have those discussions. So these areas that I believe are most important that make you a well-rounded talent acquisition leader, definitely employment law. There's a there's a body of knowledge specific around employment law that you have to be really good at, especially moving working for an organization that operates in more than one state. I'll also say this: California has its own set of employment laws, um, and if anybody in this group knows, it actually has a separate certification specifically within like SHRM because. California employment law tends to be a lot more layered than um, than laws that are, you know, kind of um, um, exist across the country. So having a solid, uh, solid knowledge of employment law, understanding best practices and emerging trends. And so understanding those, but knowing when to adopt those into your organization, I will say even to the extent that you are doing things that become a trend. Like, are you are you considered, I, I use this term, sometimes I think some people don't deserve it, thought leader or influencer. Have you evolved enough that you are now establishing a trend for how, uh, how things are actually managed? Um, being able to create good strategy uh, and process. So strategies is, is the goal, the process is the method by which you achieve uh, achieve those goals making sure you understand creating and managing a solid operating model, knowing what resources, you can spend a billion dollars on technology and resources and buttons. If you don't uh, pick the right resources, you have just wasted your money. Um, and so being really knowledgeable about not being led by the market or influenced by the seller of a product so that you don't end up with a bunch of shiny new toys and now you're not even using them uh, in an effective way. Um, knowing what your team members and team structure should look like. Um, technology, technology, technology. I mentioned you can spend a billion dollars on technology. Um, you have to be really smart out in the market when you're purchasing technology to know what, what you need to, to support your team. And then the last piece is metrics. People play games with numbers all the time. So being really solid about metrics and two things about metrics I'll share with you guys, um, the way I define metrics. Um, metrics help you measure strategy effectiveness and process efficiency. And so if, you, if your organization is asking you for metrics, you should be able to point that metric back to a measurement of one of those two things, strategy effectiveness, and process efficiency. And it'll help you. There's probably 42 different metrics you can come up with, which what are the seven or five that most adequately tell the story of data-driven business decisions. And so that's how I try to help people not be overwhelmed by all of the metrics that are out there. What are, what are the pieces um, that are most important? So I'm going to pause there because I see we have uh, some um, Q&A. Don't see anything in the chat. But Allison, I will pause there. and We can open it up. And I am more than willing to answer any question that um, anyone has. Excellent. Oh, man. Just want to take, take a moment and say thank you so much for sharing all of that with us, Kimberly. I mean, what an illustrious career. And I love that you framed it with the straight road and the roller coaster because I mean, I also, I call myself an accidental recruiter. I fell into this industry four times. I've picked it three times. And I love your point about just take a chance and find yes. out. Yes. Yes. Well, we have one question so far in here from, uh, oh, we got a few more. Um, do you want me to read the question out loud and then you can sure. answer? Okay. Sure. Yeah. So our first question is from Benjamin Stevenson in Chicago. Hi, Benjamin. Thank you for sharing such detailed uh, introduction of your background. You truly know how to block and tackle, exclamation point. Please share the honest decision to open your own agency instead of pursuing another corporate role. Are you glad you did it? How are you feeling about it? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, glad I did it. I don't regret it. Um, there are pros and cons to it. So working for a large company, you feel secure. Like I know I'm gonna get a paycheck every two weeks. And so at the same time, starting my own company, 
I was no longer under the weight of toxic corporate cultures, leaders that I did not value or respect, who had worked to undermine and work, work against me. So with that, then I had to become my own provider. So I will tell you, a decade before people would say you should start your own company, it, I wasn't time. I didn't have enough money saved up to do it. I also wasn't clear enough in what I knew and how to organize it to make it real. And so, for example, at one point as a TA leader, I had responsibility for a $2 million budget. That helped me understand how to manage money. And not that I didn't in my personal life, hadn't been paying like mortgage and you know car payment, but running a company on a budget has a, has, has a different feel, especially becoming an employee of my company because my commitment to myself was a salary, benefits, 401k, training and development, travel and overhead. And so had I not taken the time I had taken in those corporate environments, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how to do that. The biggest thing for me was organizing the, the body of knowledge that I had and then coming up with a cost structure that that supported that. And so um, it took some of my, you know, my regular savings. I did take a little bit out of my 401k, but here was my commitment to myself. I felt I my promise to myself was if my business model did not allow me to sustain myself, I would not be so prideful and then not then try to find an opportunity to go work for another company. But at that point in my life and my career, I didn't want to be under somebody else's umbrella. I wanted to create my own umbrella. So that's that's how I made that decision. Hopefully okay. that answered, answered Benjamin's question. And how long have you been running Kelton Legend now? Uh, for three years, oh. I still for three years in 2020. Does it feel like you got the, your feet under you now? It takes a good few years. I mean, it takes, it takes a good few years. And I'll tell you, like I learned some lessons early. There was a client that had reached out to me and you know it asked me, you know, for this project. I quoted them a price. We start working on it, and then they come back and say, okay, well here's everything that we want. And I said, well that's that's a different price point. And so the person I was working with was like, I don't know, like, this is what we already committed to. The VP is not comfortable. And I said, you know what? We're not going to squabble over money. I'm just, I'm going to come. So I came and I delivered the training. I send them my invoice. The HRVP came back and said, tell her to send us the invoice for the second amount that she quoted, because what she did was phenomenal. We don't want to cheat her, cheat her out of money. And so I was glad that I learned that lesson early because it helped me be committed to the value of what I provide, but it also then gave me an opportunity to see people will see your value. And so don't ever discount what you bring to the table. And there might be some clients that you have to say no to if you can't come to an agreement to say, here's your statement of work. Here's what that costs. And if there's not alignment, maybe this, this just isn't the right time for us to work together. Yes. Something you learn and grow with yes. in the wild. <laughs> for, sure. for sure. What would you say? Another question is, what's been your biggest challenge when you were in the corporate world um, before you started Kelton Legend? Um, I've always been very outspoken and not in a disrespectful, reckless way. Um, I've just never been one. If something was wrong or I felt like something could be better, um, I always felt like I had, you know, the gumption to, to speak up. And so not every environment is tolerant or accepting of people being outspoken because it'll sometimes feel like you're cutting across against, against the culture. And so for me, it was learning the right time to speak up and also learning who to partner with to help be an advocate and a champion for the things that I had very strong opinions um, about. And like I said, there are some corporate cultures that are, you know, you have to drink the Kool-Aid to survive there. I'm not a Kool-Aid drinker. So there were just some environments that were not right for me at all. But that's been my biggest challenge is just really having a mind and a mindset and knowing how to navigate um, you know, kind of politics and culture um, so that I didn't, um, you know, kind of shoot myself in the foot um, by saying things that were probably right, but just not framed up the right way or the right moment, um, you know, to kind of put those out there. 
Yeah, the combination of what you want to say with how you end up saying it. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a Absolutely. art form. Yes. Next question um, from Josh Chen. He's also here in Boulder. Um, really good question. A lot of what recruiters do on a daily basis is soft skill focused versus hard skill focus. He's wondering, how do you personally assess a recruiter's soft skills and ability to work with others when you're interviewing them? So as you are building your recruiting team, what are, how, do, how do you assess recruiters during the interview process? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So a lot of times we do get caught up on the technical, like, oh, uh, you know, what's the full life cycle recruiting process? You know, how do you adjudicate a background check? And so it's those, those questions are around hard skills. The other pieces are, you know, tell me about a time when you worked with um, a team member that you didn't necessarily um, agree with. Um, and so it's those types of questions that allow you to better, um, better understand how does this person just operate, um, you know, as, um, as a person? The, uh, another element of that is um, what I tell people, I don't need a team full of quarterbacks. I do want a team full of superstars. And that doesn't mean everybody is the, you know, I need to be on my, on my um, you know, um, a, a type A personality. There are team members who were shy and quiet but very effective in, you know, in what are in a, in a particular role. And so giving a person an opportunity to talk about the types of things that they value, how they want to contribute um, to the team, things that have motivated them, how they like to be rewarded and acknowledged. Those are the types of questions that help me understand better. What role will this person play on the team and who do I need to be as a leader to continue to foster? Not everybody's looking for some dramatic change in their lives. That's, that's just who I, if I'm left-handed, I'm left-handed. I can't make you be a, a right-handed person. And so for me, it was tapping into who is this person as a personality and how do we leverage that for that person to be successful and help the overall team be successful. Excellent, thank you. And another question, um, this one's also is from Alicia. What do you feel are the most important skills as a TA leader that are typically overlooked in the corporate world? So for sure, I'll say business acumen. Um, it was vitally important for me to understand my company, the history of my company, the industry and the peers that were adjacent. And so there are some companies who like a good face to represent TA. They, you know, they they are good at the politics, but I think the business acumen is so important because you have to understand what the drivers are. Um, you have to understand what the drivers are for you to really be uh, be successful um, in your role. The other piece I'll talk about, um, and I feel like this conversation has been had a lot lately, the human part of human resources. <laughs> um, a lot of times people are like, well, HR is protecting the company. Well, it's called human resources for a reason. And so those leaders who I believe actually do the best and are the, the best valued are those who understand the human aspects of what we do. And so um, making decisions, especially COVID, the number of people who were furloughed, jobs just, you know, gone, there has to be a humanness to how we make those decisions. I understand it's a business decision, but there has to be a humanness to it and human, human, humanness to it. And so the clinical parts get a lot of attention, but I think it's the, the human part of um, being relatable uh, compassionate, empathetic um, to people, those, those skill sets um, are invaluable to being a good leader. Yes. I, I have to say, that's one of the things I, I, I grew to love, especially in an internal recruiter role, is mm -hmm. that you get to understand literally every element of the business because you you're moving for every function. And it just, it kind of goes together. And then once you can see how it all fits, then you can like coach hiring managers to help them also see yeah. the not just 
their vertical yes, absolutely. within the organization. I think we have time for one more question, which is a question I have. You had mentioned earlier about operating model. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, it was in your, as a subject matter expert, mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. you just sort of expand on what that is and sort of how you're seeing that as it relates to the talent acquisition space? Yeah, so for me, um, working in organizations, um, different organizations, different sizes, um, they all had you know, somewhat of a different operating model. So for example, do you have recruiters who are organized by function or by division? Um, do you truly have a full life cycle recruiting model? Um, do you have um, trade-off in roles where you have hiring manager, recruiter, sourcer, recruiting coordinator. And so creating an operating model that supports how your business operates. And so many of us, you know, get you move into an environment where it's already established, or you might be fortunate to start, you know, with a startup and they say create it. And now you're like, great. But understanding enough about what the day-to-day -day operation looks like is important because if you have the wrong operating model, then you may not be able to achieve the types of results that you're looking for for your hiring goals, but you may also then not have the right team members in place to, um, to be able to deliver those results. And so um, working for large organizations, again, you know, is there one person that handles all of the software engineers, regardless to what department they're in? Is there one person that handles all of the administrative assistance regardless to what department? Or do you have recruiters that say, I have everything in the DER department, whether or not it's a non-exempt, union, non-union, senior level, whatever it is, do you have a recruiter who then can handle all of those verticals? What I can tell you is there's a different skill set and a different problem solving mindset if I am all of the administrative assistants versus I have the DER department and I have to and I'll be responsible for staffing every single position in that particular department. So that's um, kind of that's what I define as operating model. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's so many layers to the TA space and then mm -hmm. it's corporate versus staffing versus yes. enterprise. Yes. Yep. It's a roller coaster. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sure. It's funny roller coaster when I first started recruiting innovation and I was like you know it's insane at the beginning and like stressed out and I was like I just feel like I'm on such a roller coaster and my husband said at least it's your roller coaster it is your roller coaster <laughs> yes yes Re and rewarding like I said once you, and once you navigate through those days of you know second guessing and like crap this didn't go how I wanted to you still get to a day like but this is mine this is what I created I I can figure out my path forward and so it's that pride of ownership that also reassures you um, on those days as well. Love that. Do you want to click over to the last slide so folks can see your email address, um, check out your website? Yeah, and, yeah, and actually um, what I'll do, Allison, I will um, send the slide deck to you. You can Great. share it out with the team. Um, so there's my email address, my website. That's actually my real phone number. I'm not in witness protection. You guys can call me um, if you'd like to, or you know, send me a meeting notice um, to schedule some time. And um, that's that's where I'm at. Great. Well, what a wonderful session. Thank you so much, Kimberly. This is what an awesome career, and it's just also exciting just to see what is possible in recruiting and that. Yeah. Every industry recruits, every company has a recruiting function. Like you can build an amazing career in this industry. And thank you so much for taking us on your journey and sharing this amazing wisdom. I know everyone's really appreciative. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank Kimberly you. Jones, Kelton good luck. Yeah, good luck to all of you guys. Like I said, I'll, I'll email this to you. And Allison, I'll be available to you or um, anybody else uh, on the team, you know, as you guys kind of make your way through this journey. Perfect. Thank you so right. much. We really Thank you. It. Everyone have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Okay.